In a few hours, the government will reopen. We have a lot to do. After three days of a political standoff, the Senate reaches a compromise to end the government shutdown in exchange for immigration talks. Then in a tense trip to Israel, Vice President Mike Pence announces the U.S. Embassy will move to Jerusalem by the end of next year, speeding up original plans. Plus, a look at the story behind the new movie, The Post, what it can tell us about a key historical event and our current political environment. They also altered the state of the First Amendment and, uh, and the history of the world. By what? By what? By printing the truth. Dear Lord, if that's a dangerous thing to do, uh, we're in bad place. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. The federal government is going back to work. Senate Democrats and Republicans came to a meeting of the minds today on ending the partial shutdown. With that, Congress moved to make it happen. Lisa Desjardins begins our coverage. Hours into the work week shutdown just after noon, Democratic leader Chuck Schumer came to the Senate floor. The Republican leader and I have come to an arrangement. Announcing Democrats would vote en masse for a three-week spending deal. On this vote, the yeas are 81, the nays are 18, the motion is agreed to. It passed overwhelmingly with yes votes from 33 Democrats and 48 Republicans. The deal is much as it was Friday, to fund government through February 8th and to fund the Children's Health Insurance Program, which covers 9 million kids for six years. It also suspends some Affordable Care Act taxes. And there's one key promise. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said he will allow Senate votes on competing immigration plans, including a bipartisan plan to give status to so-called dreamers, young people brought to this country illegally. So long as the government remains open, it would be my intention to take up legislation here in the Senate that would address DACA, border security, and related issues the two leaders spoke on the floor, but the deal was worked out by a large bipartisan group of 25 other senators who took the issue into their own hands. It included Republican Susan Collins and Democrat Joe Manchin. This has been a great experience in that every single person has been committed to getting to yes. Every person here had their say of how we can work together and really make the place work again for America. But Democrats recognize this is a bubble of bipartisanship after weeks of animosity. There's, there's a lot of um, challenges here in terms of people trusting each other. Republicans tried to reassure Democrats. Arizona's Jeff Flake had originally been promised an immigration vote this month, but says he believes McConnell's pledge today. I think this is a pretty high-profile promise right now. If he makes it on the floor to move ahead and proceed to a bill, I think the uh, Democrats can hold into that, and so can we. That wasn't enough for some 16 Democrats who voted no, including New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. She tweeted, the bill fails to fix the moral issue we must solve. That's why I voted against it. Others, including Minority Whip Dick Durbin, who voted yes, told Dreamers this was their best chance at getting status. To all the Dreamers who are watching today, don't give up. I know that you, your lives are hanging in the balance on what we do here on Capitol Hill and with the White House. As Democrats rallied for DACA recipients, Republicans, like McConnell, painted their stance a different way. I think we've learned anything during this uh, process. It's that a strategy to shut down the government over the issue of illegal immigration is something the American people didn't understand and would not have understood in the future. Mr. President. Amidst all of this, there was one other debate about the role or lack of role of President Trump. Democrats said he was absent. The great deal-making president sat on the sidelines. But White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders indicated Mr. Trump was merely waiting for Democrats to change their minds. I am pleased that Democrats in Congress have come to their senses and are now willing to fund our great military, border patrol, first responders, and insurance for vulnerable children. 
As I've always said, once the government is funded, my administration will work towards solving the problem of very unfair illegal immigration. for the latest, along with our White House correspondent, Yamiche Alcindor. Thank you both. So, Lisa, on Friday, most of the Democrats were against this. Today, there were enough of them to make it pass. What changed? Right. Two things changed, Judy. First of all, a nuance that was very important to Democrats from Leader McConnell. Last week, he was saying that he would not commit to bring up any immigration bill that the president could not support, saying that that was pointless. Well, now Leader McConnell is saying, instead, he will allow a wide range of immigration ideas to get votes on the Senate floor, including a bipartisan deal. And, and that was significant to Democrats. Of course, they disagree over how significant. The second thing that happened, Judy, to change things Monday, a work week shutdown is very different than a weekend shutdown, and that added tremendously to the pressure on Democrats today. And Yamish, so if that's what they're saying at the Capitol, how is the White House looking at this? The White House is essentially casting this as a Trump win. The idea is that San Sarah Sanders from the podium today said that this was a Trump deal, that he came up with this, and that Democrats essentially caved. She said that they came to their senses, essentially, and she essentially doubled down on Mark Short, which is, which is what he said this weekend when he said that Democrats were throwing a tantrum. So I think that while the Hill is essentially saying that this is a bipartisan deal, the, the Republican president is essentially, essentially saying, thank, you can thank the Republicans for having your government open. So we heard uh, Lisa in Lisa's report, Yamish, uh, th that the president was uh, playing a role that was more off to the sides. What was the president's role in all this? It's really interesting. Sarah Sanders was asked today, what do you say about the president not being as active this weekend? She said, well, whatever he did worked. And essentially what she's saying is that while, yes, he was making calls, there's a there's this idea that he drew a line in the, in, the, in the sand, and that line was that he was not going to debate about DACA while the government was shut, and that actually worked. The other thing that was really interesting in that, in that briefing is that she also kind of threw her support behind this controversial ad that was released this week, and it's an ad that essentially says that Democrats would be complicit in killings by, by, by undocumented immigrants if they didn't essentially take a harder stance at immigration. So while this deal was struck, they're essentially saying that we have the exact same ideas and that we really want to... We really want to curtail immigration in this country. And Lisa, back to you at the Capitol. So where do all these fights stand, whether it's immigration? We know there was language in there that had to do with children's uh, health insurance. Um, I mean, how close are they to reaching agreement on all these things? Children's health insurance, Judy, is the one thing that really moves in today. The children's health insurance program now will be funded for six years. That is a very big deal for those nine million children who are affected by that. Everything else, Judy, we're just buying a few weeks. That's what lawmakers are doing. And on immigration in particular, Yamish and I have both been reporting the president held meetings tonight with groups of senators, but it was interesting. It was with one group of Republican senators, including some hardliners. And then separately, he met with Joe Manchin and also the new Senator Doug Jones from Arkansas, the two most, or Alabama rather, the two most conservative Democrats. So right now, the president's talking mostly to conservatives about immigration. Well, to see how that goes. Add to that, there are questions about disaster funding still waiting. And by the way, spending cuts are about to hit. Both Republicans and Democrats want to sort of raise those spending cap cut, spending cuts. It's hard to see if they to know if they'll get a deal on that. Judy, I think in all of this, this may not be the only time we talk about possible shutdowns this year. There are many factors that are woven together. It's hard to say if those will help or will choke debate here at the Capitol. And after all, this is we're just talking about three weeks. Yamish, this has been kind of an extraordinary spectacle we've been watching. Have we learned something about how our leaders operate in these circumstances? We've learned that essentially President Trump, while he while he's he has these people around him um, that have these really hardline views, he's going to really be the one leading the ship. Sarah Sanders pushed back very hard hard when people said, well, does Stephen Miller or John Kelly have veto power? She said no. And even though she was essentially saying he did step back a little and let things happen, she's essentially saying that, that Donald Trump is making the decisions here. And if it's the Donald Trump from the campaign, we know that he has some really uh, some really hardline stances. And I should say, I talked to some administration officials that say that they really have four things they want in immigration. They want to end chain migration. They want to end the visa lottery program. And they want to end, then they want $33 billion for border security. They want all that for DACA. So, uh, so there's still a lot to be negotiated yes. here. All right, Yamish Alcindor and Lisa Desjardins at the Capitol, thank you both. What a crazy weekend.
In the day's other news, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court threw out the state's congressional map. It ruled that districts had been so heavily gerrymandered to benefit Republicans that it violated the state's constitution. The court gave the Republican-led legislature until February 9th to fashion a replacement. But GOP leaders said that they would appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. This was the third day of Turkey's military offensive against U.S.-backed Kurdish fighters in Syria. The Turks say that the Kurds are allied with Kurdish rebels inside Turkey. Today, allied fighters, plus Turkish artillery, fired at Kurdish militia in the northeastern enclave of Afrin. And Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, vowed to continue despite the cost. Of course, we will have martyrs and wounded in this kind of struggle, and it will not be left unanswered. They are and will be paying a heavy price for this. Our Syrian brothers in our country will find the opportunity to return to their own homes and their own lands. Erdogan also said Russia, Syria's main ally, had agreed not to interfere with the operation. Conservatives in South Korea served notice today that they oppose warming relations with the North ahead of next month's Olympic Games. In Seoul, several hundred hardline activists burned images of North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un and its flag. That came as the North's Olympic delegation visited venues for a musical performance during the Games. Pope Francis is apologizing for demanding that victims of sexual abuse by priests show proof before they can be believed. In South America, Francis had defended a Chilean bishop against allegations that he covered up for a notorious pedophile priest. Today, flying back to Rome, Francis said that he never meant to cause more pain to the victims. I apologize to them if I hurt them without realizing it, but it was a wound that I inflicted without meaning to. I know how much they suffer, and to hear that the Pope told them to their face that they need to bring a letter with proof, it's a slap in the face. And now I realize that my expression wasn't right because I did not mean it. At the same time, the Pope said again that the Chilean bishop will stay in office unless there is actual evidence implicating him in a cover-up. Three top leaders of USA Gymnastics, the chair, vice chair, and treasurer, resigned today after an outcry over sexual assault by a former team doctor. Larry Nasser is awaiting sentencing in a Lansing, Michigan court, where more than 120 women have detailed abuse at his hands. A number of them say USA Gymnastics did not act on complaints about Nasser. On Wall Street today, the Senate deal to end the government shutdown helped push stocks higher. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained nearly 143 points to close at 26,214. The Nasdaq rose 71 points, 1 percent, and the S&P 500 added 22. And in Paris, sorry if you're about to have dinner, the rat population has exploded, and a new video has people demanding action. The amateur footage shows hundreds of rats wriggling in a dumpster. It was posted online by the newspaper Le Parisien. Officials say heavy rain, a mild winter, and construction have driven the rodents out of the sewers. Let's hope they stay there and go nowhere else. Still to come on the news hour, I speak to the White House legislative director and a Democratic U.S. senator about what's next after the shutdown. The status of President Trump's proposed border wall, Vice President Pence's tense trip to the Middle East, and much more. We return now to our lead story, the compromise struck to get the government back to work for now. I sat down just a short time ago with Mark Short, Director of Legislative Affairs at the White House, to ask President Trump's reaction to the deal. Well, Jeannie, we're pleased that the uh, government is reopened. Uh, we never understood what the position was as Senate Democrats to take uh, American troops hostage and Custom Border Patrol agents hostage over an issue that uh, really they, there's everything in the bill that is in front of them from a continuing resolution to reauthorizing children's health insurance. There was nothing Democrats opposed. There was a separate issue that was not on the table they were trying to inject into this. So we're pleased the government's open and now we could reopen negotiations with Democrats on the DACA issue and immigration. 
Well, let's talk about that separate issue, the DACA recipients, these young people who came to this country with their parents without documentation, but again, as you say, through no fault of their own. Sarah Sanders, the White House spokesperson, said today that the president is now prepared to accept permanent residency, a permanent solution for them. What does that mean? Does that mean citizenship? The president is willing to have a conversation about citizenship, Judy. I think that uh, in addition to that, so far in the negotiations, where we've moved is that Democrats have said that the 690,000 people who have those DACA permits, they're age 16 to 36, who have those DACA work permits, um, that has been the discussion so far. But Democrats have asked us to expand that, to include others in, in there, including some that get closer to the number in the full DREAM Act. We've said we're willing to do that, Judy. So we think there's actually a lot of significant progress on our side and things that they've asked for. In addition, it seems that Democrats have, have had a lot more willingness to talk about the needs we have on border security that Customs and Border Patrol has said is needed to help secure the southern border. So we see progress. It was all the more reason we were confounded by why why Democrats decided to shut down the government when there was progress going on in the negotiations. So if, if we're talking about a deal, then I mean, event, potentially citizenship for these DACA recipients, uh, the Democrats are prepared to give money on the wall. There still is real disagreement over some of these other issues. The Republicans call it chain migration. Right. Democrats talk about family migra migration, the so-called visa lottery. But are you saying the president is prepared for a deal without those other issues no, being No, Judy, I'm, I'm not saying that. I think that there was four pillars that we talked about, and there were some issues Republicans initially had beyond that and some that Democrats had beyond that. We narrowed it to the four issues of DACA, border security, the chain family migration, as well as the visa lottery program. We still think those are very important for a couple reasons. One is that if we don't solve that problem now, what's going to happen is we'll get a bill that passes just regarding DACA and border security, and we're going to end up in the same place in a few years from now, because you create an incentive for more people to come if they feel like there's going to continue to be amnesty given to them. So we need to solve the migration issue. As well, on the visa lottery front, you've covered this, I think, too. This year, the two terrorist attacks, one the pipe bomber, one the, the one who ran over innocent people with a truck, one came in on chain migration, one on a visa lottery. We think there are legitimate security needs that we need to tighten in our country. And so we want resolution to those programs, too. Well, we want to, there's much more to, to discuss about immigration. It's a huge issue, and we're going to be coming back to that in the weeks to come before this debate resumes. But I want to ask you about the president's role in this, because the picture that emerged over the weekend, uh, the, some Democrats who met with the president were part of saying this, Senator Lindsey Graham, that the president was there, but he was basically listening to the last person he talked to, that he would say one thing to a senator, I agree with you, and then he would be swayed by his his staff members who have a much more restrictionist view of immigration than he does. Right. How much of this is a president being swayed or controlled by his staff? Judy, the president's very engaged in this, and he's not being controlled by his staff. The reality is that I know Lindsey Graham is, uh, has attacked Stephen Miller by name and person as one of the president's advisors. Stephen knows an enormous amount of, about immigration. He is going to be central to a solution. He knows where there's give on the Republican side. He knows what the Democrat side wants. And so he's advising the president appropriately. I think that some of that's been a bad mischaracterization by some of the senators involved, because they think they called him and said, we've got a great deal. We want to come talk right. to you about it. They came to the White House and presented it. When they did, it was pretty hollow in those areas we're most concerned about. And so I think they were frustrated and disappointed the president wasn't accepting it. But frankly, they weren't presenting it to the president over the phone the way in reality it was when they came and showed us exactly what they were doing. But how do you, but you still have this picture of a president who was changing his, his view, his position from one hour to the next or with a, with a few hours later. It's, and, and a president who was wasn't familiar with the details. I mean, that came out in several, uh, from several senators who met with him. I think so, from, from several senators on the Democrat side, Judy, who want to paint that portrait. I don't think it's an accurate portrait. I think the president's very engaged in the conversations. He's been very focused on what he wants done. I think when the American people got to see the meeting he hosted uh, last Tuesday uh, with 20 different members, bicameral, bipartisan, I think the American people saw how the president engages in those conversations and where he was focused on them.
And Senator Graham was saying, I want the president from last Tuesday and not the other president I, we've, we've been hearing about and talking to. Well, we hope that Senator Graham will be constructive in this conversation. He has been a help to us on many fronts throughout uh, the first year of this administration. But again, we felt that what he presented to the president over the phone was not in reality what matched when you actually looked at the details of their legislation. So, for instance, when they talk about their solving the border security, they provided the $1.6 billion that our administration asked for for this year, but nothing beyond that. But further, that 1.6, also they put additional strings on it and, and said that any new technology or testing can't be used. Well, the Department of Homeland Security is constantly testing new prototypes for what they want as a physical barrier. So there's a lot of things in the details that one presented, it showed the president that it wasn't really, I think, an honest upfront deal. Well, we are going to leave it there, but we'll be certainly wanting to talk to you in the days and weeks to come on immigration and other issues. Mark Short, thank you very much. Judy, thanks for having me. And now for a Democrat's take on the deal to end the government shutdown, we turn to Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. He's a member of the party's Senate leadership team, and he joins us now from Capitol Hill. Welcome back to the news hour, Senator Great Van to be Hollen. Here, Judy. So we just heard Mark Short saying they don't know what the delay was all about. Uh, the Democrats held things up basically for nothing. So, Judy, I'm glad to hear Mark Short say that uh, President Trump is glad to see the government open because. Donald Trump had everything to do with shutting down the government in the first place and nothing to do over the last 34, 36 hours in getting the government up and running. He was only a destructive influence uh, because he would say one thing to one set of folks and the opposite uh, to others. So the reason we were able to get the government open was because Republicans and Democrats in the Senate uh, came together, uh, put together a proposal that is a step forward uh, where we were assured that many of our funding priorities would be addressed when it comes to things like children's health centers. And for the first time, we were promised a vote on a bipartisan DACA bill, something that Republicans have refused to do until now. Well, that's what I want to ask you about, because uh, there are some Democrats, members of your own party, who are saying they still don't trust that the Majority Leader McConnell is going to bring this up for a vote. What gives you the confidence in what he said over the weekend and today that he's going to do what he said he will do? Well, first of all, Judy, he said this to the American people. He didn't say this uh, just behind closed doors. Second, he made this commitment uh, to lots and lots of Republican senators who want to move forward on DACA. And third, even after three weeks, uh, we still have a lot of leverage with respect to the budget process. Uh, we'd all like to get on with the budget process, but uh, it's an opportunity to make sure that Mitch McConnell uh, keeps his word on this. Uh, in the meantime, our focus has to be on getting a strong bipartisan bill. Uh, 57 senators uh, so far support the Durbin-Graham bill. Uh, we want to get over that uh, number, and I'm confident uh, that we can get there. Uh, and if, look, if Mitch McConnell decides to totally backtrack on the statement he made in public, I think there will be very severe consequences and many tools that can be used uh, to uh, address that issue. Well, I'm looking right now at the vote in the House of Representatives, and I see that 142 Democrats, I'm told, voted against this, 45 voted for. Uh, you had, what, 18 Democrats voting against it in the Senate. Some of them are saying they're worried that what's going to happen is you're going to get right down to the wire before February the 8th, that the Republican leadership will try to rush something through, and the Democrats will lose an ability to shape immigration legislation. Well, Judy, I think there's a bipartisan majority, as I said, already 57 senators on a bill outlined uh, by Senators Graham and Durbin. So that's a very good starting point to go into this with, and I think we will uh, gain on in terms of those numbers. And that was something that uh, we'd not been promised before. In other words, Mitch McConnell had refused to even address the issue of DACA legislatively. Look, there's absolutely no guarantee that, you know, if the government had remained shut down for two, three more weeks, that there'd be any resolution um, of the DACA issue in the spending bill. Meanwhile, we now have this opportunity, and everybody should join forces. Everybody who wants to make sure that dreamers are treated fairly should join forces, get this bipartisan bill out of the Senate uh, in the next, in, in the coming weeks, uh, and then put a huge amount of public pressure on the House. If we can put a bill into the House, uh, then the country will have to be calling, you know, the phones and going to town halls and making sure the House uh, moves forward on this. 
Senator, you started out by saying the president had not been helpful in this process, and there has been criticism of the president being an uncertain negotiator. But we just heard Mark Short, the White House legislative director, say the president is willing to have a conversation about citizenship for these DACA recipients. What does that mean to you? Well, that would be great if what he just said today is something that he will also say tomorrow. Uh, you remember this goes way back to last September when uh, President Trump told both Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi he was willing to do a dreamer's bill, a clean dreamer's bill. Uh, that was many, many, many months ago. Then we saw him in front of the cameras uh, tell people that he wanted a bill of love and that he would sign whatever bipartisan proposal came before his desk. And then we had the subsequent meeting at the White House uh, where he used repulsive racist language and blew the whole thing up. Uh, he was totally unconstructive in the aftermath of Chuck Schumer's uh, meeting where we thought we'd made progress and then he turned around and did nothing. So look, the good news is we were able to get the government back up and running despite the president of the United States, who has only been a negative influence. If the president was in charge, uh, the government would still be shut down right now. In fact, there were reports saying that he thought it was a good thing for him. And of course, he did once tweet that he wanted a quote, good government shutdown. Our statement to the president is there are no good government shutdowns and there are ways to resolve these issues in a bipartisan manner. Finally, Senator, how confident are you that this, whatever spirit of bipartisanship, if you want to call it that, is going to continue for any period of time? Well, you have to take this one issue at a time, uh, Judy, and I hope we can move forward on the key budget issues, uh, obviously the Children's Health Insurance Program, but funding community health centers, dealing with the opioid crisis, making sure we have not only a good, strong, robust defense uh, spending budget, but we invest in our kids' education. All of that I hope we can tackle. And I, I do believe, I, I know, in fact, that there is a bipartisan majority here in favor of a Dreamers bill, a bill to help provide security to Dreamers. And so uh, let's get the vote on that. Let's focus on getting that done. So this is, is it everything all at once? No. Is it a step forward? Does it build momentum? Yes. Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, thank you very much. Thank you. As we've been hearing, one issue that is sure to be part of immigration talks in the coming weeks is the president's proposed border wall with Mexico. The controversial wall, a hallmark of Mr. Trump's campaign, has yet to materialize. There's still no funding from Congress. Eight prototypes are still being evaluated to see how effective they are. From PBS station KPBS in San Diego, Gene Guerrero examines the challenges of physically keeping illegal immigrants out of the U.S. And we're going to build a wall, a wall. We're going to build a wall. President Trump promised to build, build a wall. wall. Here on this dirt patch of land in southeastern San Diego are the main products of those promises. Eight prototypes of various colors and materials. Each tower's about 30 feet high, three times the height of the existing border fence just south of them. Thanks for joining CBP on what we think is an announcement to be proud of. It's been three months since they were unveiled with the Acting Deputy Commissioner for U.S. Customs and Border Protection, Ron Vitello, lauding their scale. The biggest impression I have is how big they are. The prototypes cost taxpayers $20 million, but it's unclear if the prototypes will ever be used because there's still no money for Mr. Trump's wall. The prospect of the wall has inspired several artistic protests, such as a billboard-sized image of a little boy peeking into the U.S. over the fence. More recently, artists projected light graffiti onto the prototypes from Mexico. One of them is Jill Holslin. The border wall is absolutely against the core foundational values of the United States. The core foundational values of the United States have been built upon immigration, upon um, welcoming, welcoming refugees, upon creating a society that's very diverse. But some continue to await the wall with hopeful anticipation. One of those people is Bob Maupin, a retired mechanic whose property touches the border in southeastern San Diego County. If we get a wall like they built in uh, Israel, I probably will not have to wear a bulletproof vest along the, the border anymore. 
He patrols his property for trespassers from Mexico. Hell yeah, I'm a vigilante, if you use the word before Hollywood got a hold of it. Because originally, vigilantes were people that were enforcing the law because of the lack of law enforcement. Along the southern edge of his property, he built a chain-link fence that runs parallel to the government's border fence. He says the government fence is pretty useless because it's so easy to climb, standing only 10 feet tall here with corrugations that can be used as steps. His fence is crowned with barbed wire. Still, it often gets cut by smugglers. Maupin has patched it with bundles of chain link and metal slabs. Over the years, my wife and I have spent probably $20,000 in fence repair and property repair because of these people. Now, Maupin feels he must use himself as a barrier against illegal immigration. It is my duty to protect my country from people invading it. Further east, in the Arizona desert, another man searches for people who get lost illegally crossing the border and tries to save them. Here, it's nature that stops people from coming through. Hundreds die each year from the extreme temperatures. Often, El Ortiz recovers their bodies with the help of a group named Aguilas del Desierto, Eagles of the Desert. It's another gallon. Ortiz says the existing wall is to blame for the deaths because it has pushed migrants into the desert. El muro, pues es... The wall is a method of discrimination. It's a way of saying, you're inferior to me, and here I am, marking my territory. The United States, with its policies, how many deaths has it cost? He says a longer wall will mean more deaths. Ortiz started this rescue group after finding the body of his own brother, Rigoberto, in the Arizona desert. Rigoberto died trying to cross the border illegally in 2009. I lost all illusions, all ambition for having things. I stopped having desires to be somebody. I wanted to dedicate my life to helping people who suffer this. On this search, Ortiz and his group come across a stack of letters and other things that appear to have belonged to someone who died. A large stain of grease on the desert floor indicates that a corpse was recently removed from here. I love you so much, Francisco, my love. The letters appear to be from the man's girlfriend or wife. There shouldn't be a border wall. We're all human. Back in San Diego, Border Patrol agent Joshua Wilson says the wall makes it easier for agents to do their jobs. No barrier is a be-all, end-all that's going to prevent all illegal activity. However, what it does is it allows us time to interdict the uh, attempt to enter the country illegally, and it, it acts as a speed bump. He says there are areas of the border that the wall doesn't address at all, such as the ocean. We've had people try and swim across, surf across, scuba dive, jet ski. Uh, there's no end to the creativity of the people trying to come here illegally. Maritime apprehension skyrocketed after the first wall was built. Smugglers also started digging tunnels under the fence and using drones. And now, government statistics show that most drug trafficking occurs through ports of entry. Experts on both sides of the political spectrum agree that even if President Trump's wall is built, smugglers won't stop finding new strategies for getting people and drugs into the U.S. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jean Guerrero in San Diego. Vice President Mike Pence was in Jerusalem today where he addressed the Israeli parliament and met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. John Yang has more on the tensions sparked on the trip. Judy, we're joined now by Brian Bennett, White House correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. He's in Jerusalem with the vice president tonight. Brian, thanks for joining us. In his speech before the Israeli Knesset, the vice president said that the embassy was going to be moving to, to Jerusalem a little sooner than other people had expected. What effect is this having on the Trump administration's goal of jump-starting the, uh, the peace talks? It's not going to help the peace talks. The, it's, an, it's another irritant for the Palestinians, another reason for them not to want to come to the table. Um, the State Department had been sort of soft-pedaling the announcement of deciding to recognize Jerusalem as the 
capital of Israel by saying, well, the embassy will take years to be moved because there's planning and funding and all these things that have to be worked out. Well, that didn't stand well with President Trump, and Vice President Mike Pence behind the scenes was advocating for a faster timeline, and they got it. Uh, Mike, Mike Pence announced today that he was going to— they were going to move the embassy the to Jerusalem year. before the end of 2019. And um, it, it's going to—they're uh, doubling down on uh, their support for Israel and, uh, and the hardliners in Israel. And it's uh, not going to bring the Palestinians to the negotiating table anytime soon. As a matter of fact, there was no meeting with the Palestinians today, and there was also uh, a, a protest in the Knesset. Right. So Vice President Mike Pence— came to Jerusalem and uh, didn't meet with any Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinians uh, wouldn't meet with him. And then when he gave the speech to the Knesset, uh, there were Arab Israeli members of the body that stood up and, and protested his speech and were roughly escorted out of, the, out of the body. So, you know, President Trump has said he wants to get to the, the biggest deal, which is the solving the, the peace, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and uh, right now, it looks like they're very far away from that and getting farther away. Another thing that, that they've done recently is to decide to cut aid to uh, Palestinian refugees and uh, the U.S. contribution to Palestinian refugees. And uh, that's another um, issue that didn't sit well uh, with the Palestinians or with the uh, Arab allies in the region. And they met, he met with one of the strong Arab allies of the United States yesterday, King Abdullah in Jordan. And this also came up in those talks, didn't it? Vice President Pence was in Jordan, and he met with King Abdullah in Jordan, um, who's been a staunch ally of the United States. And uh, King Abdullah had some pointed things to say to, to, to Pence and the Trump administration. He wasn't happy with the decision uh, to formally recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Uh, in fact, he said that for a year he had been uh, telling the White House uh, in person, uh, on trips to Washington, that this was a bad idea, he had concerns about it, and, uh, and he says he said that it wasn't going to help the peace process, and he also felt like uh, moves like this uh, have a direct impact on the stability inside Jordan, where there's a lot of Palestinian refugees. Also yesterday, the vice president was at a U.S. military base in Jordan, uh, spoke to the troops, and I want to play a little uh, soundbite from that speech. Despite bipartisan support for a budget resolution, a minority in the Senate has decided to play politics with military pay. But you deserve better. You and your family shouldn't have to worry for one minute about whether you're going to get paid as you serve in the uniform of the United States. So know this. Your president, your vice president, and the American people are not going to put up with it. Brian, back here at home, this uh, raised a few eyebrows. It's, uh, people were taken aback by really sort of a partisan uh, line in a speech on a U.S. military base in a foreign country. Did the president, the vice president's, uh, the, the people traveling with the vice president have any response or reaction to that? I mean, it's definitely unusual for the a sitting vice president to stand in front of troops um, at a meet and greet and make political attacks and, and go after the opposition party in the way that Pence did. And I asked the vice president uh, myself about that when, when uh, we were asking him questions um, on that base. And uh, he said that he felt very strongly that um, he was concerned about the troops who were on the front lines serving and uh, had this cloud of uncertainty over their heads about whether uh, their paychecks would come through in the next pay cycle, and he felt like it was important to, to raise that issue here. There's a tradition in the American presidency of, of leaving domestic politics at the water's edge when you leave the country and, and when, when you go outside that you represent the country. And um, you know, critics have argued that uh, Pence has pushed that limit on this trip uh, by bringing up the shutdown, uh, uh, government shutdown repeatedly. Brian Bennett of the Los Angeles Times from Jerusalem, thanks so much for joining us. Happy to be with you, John. Saturday marked one year of the Trump presidency. The shutdown punctuated an administration consistently facing controversy, often sparked by the president himself. A perfect time for Politics Monday to shed light on the road ahead, with Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report and Stu Rothenberg. He is editor of Inside Elections and a contributor to Roll Call. 
So happy uh, Monday, Politics <laughs> Monday to both of you. I started to say shutdown Monday, but it looks like, Amy, it's coming right. to an end. So all right, it lasted over the weekend. Clear political, we know there's some su substantive winners here. Right. The country comes out of this better because they That's resolved right. it. But politically, winners, losers? I think it's really hard to say that this this is going to have much of an impact. I mean, I doubt that we're going to come back in November, Judy, when we're sitting here on election night and saying, you know what turned the tide in this election? It was that three-day government shutdown. That changed the contours of the entire race, uh, of the entire, you know, election year. But I do think that it has really turn the focus now. It's going to be a substantive focus for 2018, which is this DACA issue, which is certainly not going to go away. Even if they do, they agreed to have a vote, I think the contours of what that looks like are far from certain, and that is going to have a bigger, longer-term implication. I think Democrats are also learning the hard way, what Republicans had to learn the hard way back when they were in the minority. When you're in the minority, you have very little leverage. Your base wants you to do a lot, and you feel like you need to show that you're fighting against the other party, but at the end of the day, you have very little leverage. You see winners, losers, and enduring. Uh, I, I think this here. shutdown will have the same impact that the shutdown in 2013 had, which was zilch mm -hmm. uh, yeah. when it comes to the midterms. Uh, Judy, I, I think we know that the, the president will be active over the next 10 months. There will be plenty of controversies, whether it's uh, DACA or the wall or questions about infrastructure or N North Korea. Um, oh, there's going to be a lot of things happening. So I, I think when we look back, this will be a hiccup, uh, an asterisk. Well, Amy, you're already pointing out what we were going to talk about, which is immigration. Right. We know it is going to be a factor uh, in these races this year. But but you were saying the contours aren't clear. Is it really, we really don't know how this uh, helping young immigrants uh, issue is going to play out or not? Yeah, I don't think either side really knows what it's willing to compromise on, what it's willing to sacrifice, what it's willing to say yes to. We know what some of the challenges are within the Republican conference. You've already seen the White House and Lindsey Graham kind of sp spar with each other today over what kind of bill that the White House wants versus what Senator Lindsey Graham wants to see. We know that in 2013, enough Republicans worked with Democrats to support a comprehensive immigration bill in the Senate. But we also know that the House Republicans are right. much more conservative. They're never going to go along with something that could get enough Democrat votes, Democratic votes in the Senate. And then for the Democrats, there's a lot of uh, focus just simply on the DACA plan. But we've already seen that they moved a little bit on whether they'd fund a border wall. Remember earlier? Right. In 2017, yeah. it's no money for a wall. Now they're saying, we'll give you a little bit of a wall. But what else are they willing to compromise on to be able to say, we protected this group of And we're hearing, voters. as we heard from the White House Legislative Affairs Director, the president is willing to talk about citizenship for these young immigrants. But, Stu, I want to I broaden this out to these uh, midterm elections. There are already a lot of polls out there, sure. that, so, several done just in the last week or so, asking people whether they'd rather see Democrats or Republicans take control of the Congress. Uh, ABC Washington Post has a 12-point spread, the Democrats 51 percent to 39, NBC Wall Street Journal poll, uh, just a six-point spread, but still an advantage for the Democrats. Mm -hmm. What do we read into this at this point? Well, this is so-called generic ballot question. It tries to get a sense on which direction the public is going in a partisan way, leaving out the names of the members of Congress, forgetting about your congressional district, who's running, who's, in, who's the incumbent, just who do you want to see elected, Republicans or Democrats? And th so we have Democrats with a significant advantage, but the, the difference, the devil is in the difference in this <laughs> case. Um, uh, it's not unusual that the president's party is runs at a disadvantage in the midterm elections, uh, but the difference is in, in the NBC News, Wall Street Journal, the margin is six in the ABC News, Washington Post, as the graphic we put up showed 12. That's a huge difference. If it's 12 points on election night, uh, it's likely that de Democrats will take the House of Representatives. If it's six points on election night, it's much less certain. And we'd have to look much more district by district, and I think the Democrats might even fall short at plus six. So we know the direction of the, uh, of the electorate right now, and we'll right. see how that changes over the next 10 months and whether people increasingly look to the Democrats as a way of stopping the president or sending a message of dissatisfaction 
satisfaction to the president or not. And, How do you and that's that? yeah, and that's really once you get under these numbers, I think Stu set it up perfectly. Getting under the numbers too to ask people how enthusiastic are you about voting? Are you really interested, not just in casting um, whether you're going to vote D or R, but actually showing up at the polls? And what you're seeing in the ABC. Uh, Wall Street, uh, Washington Post poll found that people who said that they were likely to vote, even bigger percentage advantage for Republicans, huh. people, for, uh, Democrat. for Democrats, I'm sorry, people who said that they were extremely enthusiastic about voting. Basically, I will walk over glass <laughs> if that's what I have to do to vote. Democrats with a 15 point advantage. Huh. And you're starting to see this, even in the CNN poll that had a small Democratic advantage, like that NBC Wall Street Journal poll, when they asked, people on their level of enthusiasm for voting, Democrats had went from a five-point advantage to a 15-point advantage. So we've seen this, Stu and I were talking and in the elections. In, in state the legislative elections. elections, the Virginia governor's race. Yeah. The only caveat is uh, that events between now and November yeah. will either add to enthusiasm in one party or the other or subtract from it. But these polls will give us ideas, and they'll be done repeatedly throughout the well, year. Well, it's like a puzzle, Judy. You've got to look at a number <laughs> of questions, then you have to look at actual elections, and then I think you'll get a sense on which way the cycle is going. Mm -hmm. Well, it's January the 22nd. We have a whole <laughs> 10 months to figure <laughs> it wait. out completely. Thank you both very much. Stu Rothenberg, Amy Walter, Politics Monday. You're welcome. Thank you. Finally tonight, President Trump's approach to and battles with many in the news media have been a consistent feature of the first year of his presidency. Similar tensions resonate in a new movie about how a former president battled the press. That fight was over the publication of the Pentagon Papers, secret documents about the war in Vietnam, a milestone case for press freedom and the First Amendment. It all started with the New York Times, but the fight was soon joined by the Washington Post. Jeffrey Brown has a look behind the movie and the events of that era. June 1971. Do you have the papers? Not yet. But he soon would. The papers were the Pentagon Papers, a classified history of the Vietnam War created by the Defense Department. In the film The Post, Washington Post editor Ben Bradley, played by Tom Hanks, and publisher Catherine Graham, Meryl Streep, must obtain the papers and then decide whether to defy a court order and publish them. The all-star project, directed by Steven Spielberg, takes on big and consequential history and issues of press freedom and national security that resonate to today. But Liz Hanna, the screenwriter later joined by Josh Singer, says her focus was on a smaller individual story about Catherine Graham, the high society woman thrust into leadership of her family-owned paper, finding her way in a male-dominated world. This was the first Fortune 500 CEO who was a woman, and she had been told her whole life that she wasn't good enough. And then she was put in this position where she had to make this choice, and she had to fight her voice. And there's something very universal about that. There's something about that to me that is very relatable. I've spent ma many times in a room where I'm the only woman or I'm the odd man out. And that's the story I think that we need now is the story of people finding their voices. The real Catherine Graham told her own story, including taking over the paper after her husband's suicide, in a memoir that would win the Pulitzer Prize in 1998 and spoke of it in an interview on the NewsHour. I didn't really transform myself. Working transformed me. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to work not thinking that my role would develop as it did. I went to work because I found that I owned the controlling shares of the company. And I thought, well, if this is so, I need to learn what it is that's at stake here and what the issues are, because maybe someday I will have to make some sort of decision that I have to be intelligent about, so I better know. The film is set as the Washington Post company is about to go public, so the stakes for Graham were especially high. We see the cozy relationship she had with key political figures, including Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, played by Bruce Greenwood, the very person who'd commissioned the Pentagon papers and then push to have them kept from public view. And if you publish, he'll get the very worst of them, the Colsons and the Ehrlichmans, and he'll crush you. I know, he's just awful, but I... He's a, Nixon's a son of a...
He hates you. He hates Ben. He's wanted to ruin the paper for years, and you will not get a second chance, Kay. The Richard Nixon I know will muster the full power of the presidency, and if there's a way to destroy your paper, by God, he'll find it. The Pentagon Papers were originally leaked to New York Times reporter Neil Sheehan by Daniel Ellsberg, a former Defense Department analyst who came to believe the government was lying about the progress of the war. Ellsberg spoke in 2010 on the PBS program POV. As the Pentagon Papers showed, and I've often said that I feel very regretful that I had not put out those documents when I could have in 1964 and 65. I think that a war really might have been avoided. Times reporters spent three months studying the papers. James Goodale, then lead counsel for the Times, told me there was a lot on the line. The news people were very concerned that they had fake documents. They didn't know who News Ellsberg was and they didn't care who he was because they wanted to make their own determination whether the documents they had were authentic. If they were not authentic, it would be very hard for the New York Times to recover from that uh, blow. On June 13, 1971, the Times began publishing stories until the I Nixon administration, claiming a the violation American of the Espionage Act, Act, secured a court injunction against the paper, a first in American history. The movie version focuses on the Washington Post efforts to play catch-up, its success at getting hold of the papers, and then the decision to publish while the Times was silenced. In a landmark First Amendment decision, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the two newspapers. Tom Hanks told me recently how the story resonated for him then and now. That truth was so volatile and so, um, what's the word I'm looking for, almost so, so toxic to, to, at that time, the present day, that no one wanted to talk about it. And Ben Bradley in the Washington Post for and Kay Graham for, for about a week, not only altered the state of their uh, uh, newspaper empire, but they also altered the state of the First Amendment and, uh, and the history of the world. By what? By what? By printing the truth. Dear Lord, if that's a dangerous thing to do, uh, we're in bad place. In fact, in the midst of our current period of media and White House contention, director Steven Spielberg decided to rush the film into production. He spoke at a recent forum. There were a lot of fires being lit, and, and of course the evening news was lighting most of the fires, but we really felt that we could get into the national conversation and make this movie as quickly as possible and make it as well as we possibly could. The film has received mostly glowing reviews, and though losing out at the recent Golden Globes, is expected to compete for Oscar and other other awards. One criticism, its focus on the post when the rival New York Times deserves the credit. Former Times counsel James Goodale calls it a good film, bad history. Although a producer has artistic license, I think it should be limited in a situation such as that, this, so the public comes away with an uh, understanding of what the true facts are in this case. And I think that if you're doing a movie now, when Trump is picking on the press for fake news, you want to be authentic. You don't want to be in any way fake. The film's co-writer Liz Hanna, though, believes it gives the Times its due. The work that Neil Sheehan did with Dan Ellsberg and with his team at the Times was remarkable, and we wouldn't have the Pentagon Papers if it weren't for them. And that is a story in and of itself. But the story that I wanted to tell was a story of Kay Graham and then the story of how Kay Graham and Ben Bradley became the superhero team that we know them as. And this was really the beginning of this team. Uh, this is the team that led to Watergate. Indeed, the Pentagon Papers story was followed just one year later by the Watergate break-in that would lead to the downfall of President Nixon, not to mention another famous film about the Washington Post. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Washington.
on the NewsHour Online right now, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked about her experience with sexual harassment during a Q&A at the Sundance Film Festival this weekend. You can watch her answer and hear her thoughts about the Me Too movement. That's on our website, pbs.org slash NewsHour. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. You're watching PBS.